100 years ago tomorrow, April 12, 1861, Southern troops fired on Fort Sumter, and the Civil War plunged this nation into four years of the bitterest fighting this continent has ever known. In the next 30 minutes, Expedition St. Louis will explore a little-known battle of the Civil War. To ensure absolute accuracy in this account, Expedition St. Louis camera crews went to the site and, using 20th century tools, probed into the past. Our helicopter surveyed the land from the air. Ground crews searched the terrain for the tangible fragments of battle. To faithfully recreate the events of that day, actual on-the-spot drawings by combat artists and illustrators of the time are used. Join us now as Expedition St. Louis takes us into the past, back to the St. Louis of 1861. These men fought for their beliefs, and they died for them. Here lie the men of the North. These men had their cause, too. They wore the butternut gray and died for the South. Where did they fight and die? They were mostly Missourians and they died for Missouri in Missouri. This is the site of the Battle of Wilson's Creek, where first blood was drawn in the early morning of August 10, 1861, on an inconspicuous bluff now called Bloody Hill. Here in the peaceful Ozarks, 15,000 men in blue and gray met in battle. The men of the North were led by Nathaniel Lyon, the man who saved St. Louis for the Union. This Expedition St. Louis will trace the desperate days of General Nathaniel Lyon and the men of St. Louis, those desperate weeks and months that culminated on a sultry August day in 1861 with the Battle of Wilson's Creek. Behind me is a statue of General Nathaniel Lyon, soldier, patriot, man of decisive action. Largely because of his efforts, Missouri, a border state, was on the side of the Union during the Civil War. This is Lyon Park on Broadway in South St. Louis, a 10-acre memorial to Lyon, deeded to the city by Congress in 1869. Behind the statue, about a block away is the entrance to the historic old St. Louis Arsenal. When Captain Nathaniel Lyon was ordered to duty here in February of 1861, the Arsenal was the hub of conspiracy and center of a storm of controversy. We are standing on the grounds of the St. Louis Arsenal, which was at that time one of the most important munitions centers in the nation. As the dull and ominous thunder of the coming Civil War muttered threateningly along the horizon, the arsenal became the pawn for the military ambitions of two widely opposite political groups. One stood for slavery and the South, the other for freedom and the North. As the fateful year of 1860 drew to a close, the relentless pressure of events piled up. Time was running out. On February 7, 1861, Captain Lyon reports for duty. From here, he begins his fateful journey of decision. What brings him to St. Louis? What could turn a captain into a general in less than 90 days and make him a hero to the Union? The events of history quicken on November 7, 1860, as the fates set their sights on Nathaniel Lyon. The news is carried to the nation. Lincoln is elected. In Missouri on the same day, Claiborne Jackson, Southern sympathizer, is elected governor. 
Within weeks of Lincoln's election, the size of the United States begins to shrink almost daily. December 20th, South Carolina withdraws from the Union. The parade of secession has begun. On January 25th, Isaac Sturgeon, Assistant Treasurer of the United States, in charge of the Customs House in St. Louis, writes a letter to lame duck President Buchanan. He is concerned. There is $400,000 in the Customs House. The St. Louis arsenal is filled with the weapons of war, dangerous in the wrong hands. He states, if either the Republicans or the secessionists should seize the arsenal, war would begin at once. Isaac Sturgeon's letter would have far-reaching results. Just six days later, on January 11th, a Lieutenant Thompson and 40 men arrived to guard the Customs House. But all of Sturgeon's fears began to take tangible form within 48 hours. On January 9th, Mississippi leaves the Union. And on January 11th, the legislatures of two more states meet in extraordinary session. Before the day is out, both Alabama and Florida vote to secede. January 20th, Georgia follows her sister states out of the Union. January 26th, Louisiana votes for secession. January 29th, the War Department telegraphs to Fort Scott, Kansas. It is addressed to Captain Nathaniel Lyon. The message is terse and direct. Repair at once with your command to the St. Louis Arsenal. The die was cast. The man who would control the immediate history of Missouri had been chosen. On a cold and rainy day like today, back in February 6th of 1861, Captain Lyon arrived here in St. Louis. He took over this building on the grounds of the St. Louis Arsenal as his command post. He quickly sensed the danger to the arsenal in the undercurrents of intrigue running through the city. Who holds the arsenal holds St. Louis, and who holds St. Louis holds Missouri, was the slogan of the day. Captain Lyon realized that immediate steps must be taken to secure his command. Time is running out because on February 1st, the giant state of Texas withdraws from the Union. The Confederacy is nearly complete. On February 18th, in ceremonies at the state's capital in Montgomery, Alabama, Jefferson Davis takes the oath of office as provisional president of the Confederate States of America. By now, Lyon has found a powerful friend in St. Louis politician Francis Blair. The Republican leader of the city helped solidify support for Lyon in a divided St. Louis. April 12th, the fuse is lit. On the Carolina coast, Fort Sumter, cut off from the mainland for months, is fired upon. War has begun. That same day, Simon Cameron, Secretary of War, requests Governor Jackson to raise four regiments of troops. Jackson refuses, answering that not one man will Missouri furnish to carry on such an unholy crusade. The Union continues to crumble. On April 17th, Virginia, the state called the mother of presidents, votes to secede. Rebellion simmers slowly to a boil in Missouri. On the night of April 20th, 200 Southern sympathizers raid the United States arsenal at Liberty near Kansas City. Governor Jackson acts to bring the state under Southern control. On May 3rd, he orders General D.M. Frost of the state militia to encamp the troops under his command for training at Lindell's Grove near Grand Avenue. Captain Lyon sees that this could be the first step of an attempt to seize the arsenal. The best plan for defense is to attack. The butternut gray of the Confederacy is getting close to Missouri. Tennessee leaves the Union on May 6th. On that morning, 
General Frost openly marches his 635 militiamen through the streets of St. Louis. Their destination, Grand Avenue and the newly christened Camp Jackson. Arms are forthcoming. On May 8th, the steamer J.C. Swan delivers a cargo marked Marble but the boxes contain siege guns for an attack on the arsenal. Captain Lyon makes his move on the morning of May 10th. At 10 a.m., Camp Jackson is surrounded by 7,000 men. Frost and his 635 soldiers surrender. They march out, prisoners of Nathaniel Lyon. As news of the surrender spreads, southern sympathizers converge on the area. Insults are shouted. Soon, rocks fly through the air. Shots are fired, and men die on the streets of St. Louis. Lion's troopers fight back. In a few minutes, 15 are dead. 32 die in the riots that last for several days. Nathaniel Lyon now had a firm grip on both the arsenal and the city. But he was not a man to lose the advantages that he had won. He continued to enlist troops, and on May 31st, 1861, he became General Lyon, commanding more than 10,000 men. Governor Jackson, his house of cards crumbling, asked for a conference with General Lyon. The place is the Planters Hotel on 4th Street between Chestnut and Vine. The date, June 11th. It is a gathering to determine the fate of Missouri. Present are General Lyon, Francis Blair, Governor Jackson, and General Sterling Price, commander of the Missouri State Guards. For the sake of smoother negotiations, General Price speaks for Governor Jackson. Blair takes the field for General Lyon. Jackson has apparently decided to try to hold Missouri completely neutral. But Lyon rejects Jackson's proposal. He says, I would rather see every man, woman, and child in this state dead. This means war. Once back in Jefferson City, Jackson issues a call for 50,000 men to, quote, defend the autonomy of the state of Missouri. Acting quickly, on the 13th, Lyon sets out to capture Jefferson City before Jackson can assemble rebel troops. He loads his men, munitions, and horses on three river steamers for an amphibious expedition up the Missouri River to the capital. By the time the paddle wheelers reach Jefferson City two days later, Jackson and his men have deserted the town. The landing is unopposed. Lyon appoints a rump military governor to administrate on behalf of the Union. As soon as he has sketchily fortified the town, he marches in pursuit of the retreating Jackson. North meets South for the first time on the 17th in a sharp skirmish at Boonville. Jackson is defeated and retreats toward the Arkansas border. On July 3rd, Lyon moves out of Boonville after erecting defensive positions. He is determined to meet the secessionists in a decisive battle that will break the back of resistance in Missouri. Colonel, later General, Franz Siegel, one of Lyon's junior officers, has the next opportunity to meet Jackson's forces. July 4th, find Siegel pitted against 4,000 southern troops near Carthage. Siegel is to contain the rebel forces until Lyon can arrive with reinforcements. But Jackson orders a troop of cavalry into the woods bordering the roadway where the battle is centered in a flanking feint. Siegel, thinking he is being surrounded, retreats to Springfield. The preliminary is about over, and the curtain is about to go up on the final act in the life of General Nathaniel Lyon. In late July, Lyon and the Union forces are encamped in Springfield. 
Jackson and General Price are positioned at Cowskin Prairie near the Arkansas border with 5,000 men. They are waiting for General Ben McCullough, a former Texas Ranger, to bring his newly trained troops up from Arkansas. General Lyon has a problem that is just the opposite. He's losing his little army of 5,500 men day by day. The 90-day enlistments of many of his men are expiring. Back in St. Louis, General Fremont, commander of the Department of the West, is diverting reinforcements for Lyon on a wild goose chase to Bird's Point, opposite Cairo. So there are no replacements coming. On July 25th, General Price makes his move. He marches to Cassville to join McCulloch and swell the Confederate ranks to 8,200. 2,500 additional men arrive on July 29th. Nearly 11,000 are now arrayed against Lyon. At this point, Sterling Price yields his command. As chief of a state militia, he is outranked by McCulloch, who is head of a regular unit of the Confederate Army. The largest military force in Missouri moves out. August 2nd, South meets North, as the overture to Wilson's Creek thunders on stage. Lyon sends an advance guard to engage the rebels. McCulloch again tries the cavalry flanking attack that routed Siegel at Carthage. It doesn't work. This time, the men in blue savagely attack and head for the center of the rebel line. It cracks. McCulloch pulls his forces back toward the peaceful farmland and wooded area of Wilson's Creek, 10 miles southwest of Springfield. At Wilson's Creek, McCulloch, Price, and their 11,000 men rest, surrounded by plentiful water and standing corn that feeds men and horses. Lyon knows he must move quickly. He's outnumbered nearly two to one. Fremont, secure in his headquarters at the Brandt House in St. Louis, refuses to send men, munitions, or food. He is still concentrating on the supposed threat to Cairo. Lyon knows that if he doesn't attack, Price and McCulloch will be free to roam the state at will. If he waits too long, his troops will be civilians again. He calls a conference of his senior officers. What do they think he should do? Retreat, remain garrisoned in Springfield, or attack against overwhelming odds? They recommend retreat from their extended position. Then a message comes in from a reconnaissance patrol. They report the exact position and disposition of the enemy. His mind is made up. He will attack. It is August 9th, 1861. At 6 p.m., the little army moves out of Springfield. This is the actual terrain as it looks today. It was nearly like this on that day 100 years ago. A light rain was falling as the troops marched steadily to the southwest and the rendezvous with destiny. Lyon splits his forces, detaching the hapless Colonel Siegel with 900 troops to execute a flanking attack from the southeast. This is the old wire road they march down. At 1 a.m., Lyon's men are 200 yards from the Confederates. They make a cold camp and wait for the dawn. The rebel pickets have been withdrawn because McCulloch thinks the rain will make an attack impossible. He doesn't take the reckless daring of Nathaniel Lyon into consideration. 6 a.m. Cannon fire blasts through the rural silence. Lyon, commanding the 1st Missouri and the 1st Kansas, takes a position on what is to be known as Bloody Hill. To his right rear, the cannon of Captain Totten's battery pour a murderous fire into the enemy below. In the cornfields to his left, on the east side of the creek on the low ground, infantrymen grapple in hand-to-hand -hand combat. To the southeast, Siegel attacks the rebel camp and takes it.
His men begin to plunder. A column approaches. Siegel's troops think it is the first Iowa. Too late. As they are fired upon, they find it is the first Louisiana. They break and run. Siegel forces his prisoners to haul his cannon as he retreats back to Springfield. Lyon has been wounded twice, but he continues to lead his troops. As he rallies the first Iowa, the general is shot in the chest. He falls in the arms of his orderly, Albert Lehman. He says, Lehman, I am going. Nathaniel Lyon is dead. The battle rages on. Major Sturgis, ranking surviving Union officer, commands. At 11.30, General McCulloch and Major Sturgis regroup their forces, count their dead and remaining ammunition. Sturgis finds that he is desperately low. He retreats. McCulloch does not follow. The Confederates, too, are badly mauled. The battle is over. With casualties at 16%, over 2,400, it has been the bloodiest battle ever fought on American soil. It is a standoff, but it breaks the back of the Confederate military resistance in Missouri. The desperate days of General Lyon were ended. The Battle of Wilson's Creek was history. Today, it is all but forgotten. But as awareness and interest in the Civil War quickened during this centennial, we hope that more Missourians will realize and remember what Nathaniel Lyon and the Battle of Wilson's Creek meant to the course of the war. Soon, it is hoped, there will be a Wilson's Creek National Monument. Congress has already authorized the project. And in Springfield, a dedicated group banded together as the Wilson's Creek Battlefield Commission is raising money to purchase the 1,000 acres of battlefield site in order to present it to the government. But we of St. Louis should realize that during those six months of 1861, Nathaniel Lyon left his indelible mark on the city. Yes, those were the desperate days for the Union, Missouri, St. Louis, and for the ill-fated Nathaniel Lyon. This is Springfield, Missouri today. It's changed considerably in the 100 years since it was the garrison town for General Lyon's army. But everywhere, there are the reminders of those desperate days. Expedition St. Louis crews traveled here to find out what Wilson's Creek and Springfield are like today. One constant reminder of that August day a century ago is the Federal Cemetery. Here are buried the men who died on the banks of Wilson's Creek. The general who died on the field is not here with his men. A monument commemorates his death but Nathaniel Lyon is buried in his family plot in Willimantic, Connecticut. The men who wore the gray of the Confederacy lie buried on the other side of a wall that divides the cemetery. To the southwest of Springfield is the Wilson's Creek area, which is relatively unchanged from that day in 1861. The crew, using metal detecting devices, searched the battle site looking for buried traces of the conflict. With constant reminders like this turning up, the past comes alive once again. In these days of satellites, outer space, and hydrogen bombs, it is perhaps a wise thing to look back into our past, realize and appreciate Nathaniel Lyon and the men who fought and died on both sides to preserve this country as we know it today.